If it is Tuesday, that means it's time for the Comic Book School live show, because at Comic Book School, we own Tuesday. Today is Tuesday, March 15, 2022. If you're a first-time creator hoping to get your first exposure into comics publishing, a rising talent building your audience, or an old grizzled bro like me, we welcome you to Comic Book School, where we'll talk about the craft and business of making comics. My name is Buddy Sclera, and I'm the founder of Comic Book School. I don't know why I'm doing so much with my hands tonight, but hey, wait, whatever. This is a place where people can go to learn about the craft and business of making comics. I am also a comic book writer and a publisher with nearly 30 years of comic book business. Looking at me, you wouldn't have thought that. Anyway, um, let me just switch Mike into the room. I am joined, I'm joined uh, by, why don't I read your bio here, three-time Emmy award-winning television writer, former com wizard editor and a true legend among hermits mike yes. hello hello i'm here uh, again hermits are like really you yeah. can stay home that long oh yes it's good times you, is, are you wearing nice. a, are you wearing a, a robe tonight i am wearing my robe today yes i had it on all day and i will keep it on until i go to bed you look good mike Thank you look you. Uh, yeah you look relaxed <laughs> it's just how you always look yeah, you know, well, I try. It's a so, Mike, we have a we have a good show tonight because there's people here other than us. We have a good show every week, bud. Do we? No. <laughs> <laughs> but we have fun. That's all that counts. Yeah, and I what, we already have a comment. Is there somebody who've already joined? Vince already joined us. Look at this. Vince joined us already. Early on, he gets the first comment. Way to go, Vince. Way to go, Vince. I like Vince. He's a talented creator. We're going to be hearing more about Vince because he's helping us on our NFTs, Mike. You're all NFT'd up, right? I am I am so far behind on NFTs, it's ridiculous. All right. Well, here's what we got tonight. We're going to be having a pop-on guest. Okay. We're going to be having the return of Paul Castiglia. Okay. Um, due to popular response, Paul is back and he's going to unpack uh, the different ways that he has been writing for comic books, uh, mostly focused on all ages, but he's done some really interesting stuff in terms of writing for toy companies as well. Excellent. He does what the toys, uh, right? Mad Mad Cave. No. No. Yes. That no. was two weeks ago. Oh, it was two weeks ago. Yeah, you know. <laughs> no, he works at our. He used to work at Archie. Oh, Comics. he's the Archie Archie yeah. Comics. Yes, he yes. worked at Archie Comics for a long time. Yeah. But he wrote. He wrote for Mattel. Uh -huh. Um. He he he's written a couple nonfiction books. Uh, he did a collection of Archies. So Sonic the Hedgehog the guy's really talented. Yeah, he does. I don't know why he likes us, but yeah, well, like, you know, he's going to be here, and we got a woohoo from Vince. Yeah, Vince. So, Vince is here. He's in the room by himself. It's <laughs> he's, echoing in there. He's, he's like woohooing to, to us. <laughs> so, Mike, I, I've got some interesting news uh, this week. Oh. I'm going to be doing something uh, very uh, exciting tomorrow. You want to hear about it? Yes, I do. All right, then. So I'm going to share my screen and I'm going to share. Let me look oh, right, oh, right over here. OK, here we go. Looking around uh, tomorrow at four o'clock. Um, they're going to be having me on the Valiant Twitter uh, talk show, whatever it is, Twitter Spaces. You know Twitter Spaces, Mike? I, you know, no, I don't know what that is. Yeah, so Twitter Space, uh, which has traditionally been, you know, you just type and you share your thoughts in 140 characters, and then it became like 280 characters. Um, now it's like Clubhouse, so all you can do is talk. That's That's... Weird. It's actually really good, though. You're okay. you're on Twitter, and I've been on a few of these. These are good. So they are going to feature me because I co-wrote with Darren Sanchez. You know Darren? I do um, know Darren. A three-page story about NFT. So I'll be on that show tomorrow, uh, 4 o'clock, on the Valiant.NFT uh, channel. So if you if you don't yet follow Valiant, uh, you definitely should. I'll put this uh, in, the, uh, in the chat and into the show notes. Uh, what do you think of that? I think it's it's very cool, and they're they are lucky to have you. Oh, I I appreciate your support. And what do you do? You just chat with the people. They just throw out questions, and you answer them in Twitter verse. I I think so. I'm not 100 percent sure how this works. Oh, okay. uh, I think we'll just be talking about NFTs and Valiant. It was a it was a dream come true for. Oh, hold on, Twitter Spaces is like Discord Lite. Oh, okay, that cleared it right up. Uh, yeah, yeah. I don't I don't know what any of those words mean. 
Uh, no, I'm going to actually be on their Discord as well. So um, I like doing stuff like this. You know me, Mike. I like to talk. You do. And you're good at it. I'm good at it. And you make people happy when you talk. I do. Hmm. Um, so what do you say we, uh, we start? I'm going to pull up my graphic here. We're going to pull up my graphic because today, today, we have something special. We have a pop-in guest. A pop-in guest. Now, a pop-in guest is somebody who hasn't been pre-planned very far in advance, uh, just had something interesting to share, and uh, we just thought, well, who better to bring on uh, than the beloved Mike Ponce? And I do say beloved uh, because that's how he's referred to in mail. Like, you mail something to his house, and it says the beloved Mike Ponce. I'll never forget the beloved. <laughs> <laughs> the mail will so, not get through if it doesn't say that. So, Mike, you um, you were working intensely on a project and um, I was uh, just blown away by this project. And I asked you to come and join on the show and just tell us what you were working on. And while you're talking about it, I'm going to uh, pull up the image. I'm going to pull Mike off the screen. Mike, you're going to have to get off the screen. Okay, I'm leaving. Okay, but don't go far, Mike. Um, so I'm going to pull this up. So th what is this? Okay, this imagination here was kind of a, a group idea between myself and a, a fellow artist where I live in in Florida named Francisco Gonzalez. We decided that we wanted to try to contribute something to the local community here and uh, design a food truck, throw some really beloved characters on there and some features and really try to make something that's both artistic and pulls from my background of comic work and his uh, traditional uh, acrylic painting works and try to make something really special. So this past month we were outside in the wonderful Florida winter month uh trying to paint this sucker and uh it took us about two two weeks or so uh to get there about eight hours a day and we got uh the truck originally actually wasn't white it had other vinyl stickers and whatnot it took us a couple days to clear that out and uh that's the end result there pretty much it's about 90 percent done minus a couple things here or there um and that's what we ended up coming up with this is for lowry parkade in tampa um a really nice uh, arcade bar as a matter of fact the original first one there in tampa um, and I'm really proud to have, to have had the opportunity to work on this and put my spin on a couple of, you know, beloved characters, you know, from obviously Boba Fett, uh, Ice Cold Beer Girl. You got Pac-Man, Donkey Kong, some ghosts, Dig Dug, uh, and Zangief from Street Fighter. And there were some other, you know, Easter eggs in the back that you showed with Luigi uh, and Wimpy. So had a lot of fun doing this. It was a great experience for me being primarily a digital artist. It was quite the challenge. Uh, but luckily, I've got uh, good friends in low places. So it helped out. <laughs> Mike, I, I number one, I'm blown away by this. I just the, the work on this is incredible. What what is great about this, and I'm gonna bring now I'm gonna bring Mike the solo back. What's great about this, Mike Ponce, is that as a working artist, uh, there was a need, you pivoted, and this is paying work, right? Like this is what you do. You this is work. And I think what's important to note for our community is there are a lot of opportunities to express your comic art and your creativity, and you did this on a completely different canvas. Uh, what was it like working on a completely uh, different canvas? I'm glad you asked, it was terrifying. Um, <laughs> a lot of sleepless nights, <laughs> a, lot, a lot of worry, but but like I said, I had a friend of mine uh, who has a bit more experience, and it was really both humbling, and, and I was very grateful for this opportunity, because you just never know what you can incorporate into your current tool set that you can apply toward the things that you do. And, um, you know, when it came to doing color matching w without my, my beautiful color wheel on, you know, Clip Studio or Photoshop, it was a whole different world. I was, uh, I was definitely treading water for a while. But once you get through the kind of nerves of it and you accept what the process is, it really is a, a, um, a very fulfilling feeling and something to, to, to really be proud of when you get through it. Um, like anything else, you'll go through your imposter syndrome. But at the end of it all, it's part of who you are. All right, Mike, I'm going to put you on the spot. We didn't talk about this ahead of time. Mm -hmm. uh, what's one thing that you learned as an artist by working on this project that you wouldn't have known had you not worked on a canvas like this? Ooh, that's a great question. There, there are a few answers, I suppose. Let's um, keep it nine or less, Mike. Yeah, absolutely. I, I, don't want to, I don't want to get too technical. I think it really is hmm, what I learned from it really is what's what's been reinforcing my whole career to this point, which is not being afraid to try something that I might not be intimately familiar with. 
So, you know, sure, I can draw something, but doing it on that big of a scale, that presents a whole different set of challenges. There are, there are many approaches you can take to do it. You can project it, you can freehand it, you can grid it. And we did a combination of all of those different things in order to, to make it feel organic and, and correct with different coloring styles on each of the different characters. Um, so really, I, I think the overall lesson I learned was to continue to be fluid, to continue to accept those challenges and really to see things to fruition. I, I know a lot of my friends that are artists that put a lot of time and energy into things, whether writing or, or doing the illustration part of it. And sometimes we'll just put it in a sketchbook and put it away for, for a, a certain amount of time, come back to it later. And it just really pays to go through the entire exercise, finish it and take stock of what you've learned. And I, I certainly did that with this project. I love this, Mike, and, and people should check out uh, your website. It is, um, uh, let me just go over here and share this. It is uh, uh, MikeDoesArt.com. Uh, your Twitter handle is right up, there, right up there. You can see his <laughs> Twitter handle, and he does the art. And actually, look at this. The guy has improved it literally since last night when we, when I when I gave him a little bit of feedback. He, he's, uh, he is amazing. This is great stuff, Mike. I'm trying to get there. Thank you. I appreciate the guidance you always give me. Thank you. Well, I'm full of guidance. Isn't that right, Mike Fasolo? Well, you're full of something. I'm full of something. Anyway, thanks for being our, our pop-on guest, uh, Mike Ponce. It is a pleasure. Your work is beautiful. People should follow him at Mike Does the Art. And uh, and uh, look for more things because uh, Mike is one of my secret weapons in building our, our first wave of NFTs. I'll see y'all soon. See you later, Mike. Thanks for joining Thanks, Mike. Me. It looks great. Thank you, guys. Good stuff. I appreciate that wholeheartedly. Thank you, guys. Bye-bye now. I agree. Uh, that is amazing art. You know, I have to imagine that it's, like, very difficult to paint over weird curved surfaces and try to get the proportions of things and figure things out. He did show photos. He didn't show photos of himself uh, sick. Because he said he worked through the night, the temperature dropped, he wasn't well dressed. He did it over a couple of nights and ended up going home Beating sick. Up, with the flu. Wait, hold on, Mike. I'm gonna bring you back. Hold on, I'm gonna bring you back, Mike. You you you, you worked yourself sick, right? I I gave myself walking pneumonia. I sure did. Oh wow. Yeah, yeah. But as an artist, Mike, that's painting pneumonia. That's that's the difference. That's right. There's ammonia somewhere in the air, so that, that works. <laughs> but you did. You 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 gave for your craft, right? I, I sure did. I, I knew I had to get it done. I had a timetable on which to do it, and it was new unexplored territory. So I put in the hours needed to figure it out, and that included, you know, a quick trip to the urgent care. But that's fine. Yeah. Well, you know, they can cure pneumonia. It's true. But they, but they can't replace that art that he left down there in Florida. That's good, true. That's good work, true. Mike. Thanks for getting sick on behalf of <laughs> suffering for your art. That's what I'm here for. <laughs> yeah, that was that was tough, man. He was telling me, he's like, oh, I'm working on this thing. He sent a few photos. I saw him putting it on the Instagram uh, feed or on Twitter or whatever. And then he goes, oh, I caught pneumonia. And I'm like, wow, that's... That, that is suffering for That's your why own. it's safer for you to stay inside the house, Mike Pasola. Yeah, and wear my robe because, you and know, your robe. I, don't, I don't have to do anything. So um, our first guest uh, official um, uh, who joins us here officially is Paul Castiglia. Uh, Paul is, um, I, I kind of, and he has a Wikipedia page. Here I am. Doing this day in and day out, Mike. I still don't have a Wikipedia page. How do you, do you have not a have a Wikipedia page? You have a Wikipedia page? Yeah, I do. You have an IMDb page. I have a lot of pages. But our guest actually has an IMDb page. I'll show you what that looks like. He's he's done the he's done the writing. So you're not the only person, Mike, who's done the writing. He's done the writing. He look at this. He's got the he's got the writing credits. Oh. He's got the writing credits. He's done all kinds of different things. Um, he has a blog where he blogs about Abbott and Costello and they other still have new... blogs. They still, have, they still have blogs. Oh, I'd, if I'd known that I'd been blogging. No, you would not be. You would be <laughs> doing exactly what you do. Uh, and here he is on, on the Twitters. Um, uh, please welcome uh, my good friend. And um, I'm going to find the button. My good friend, Paul Castiglia, who uh, one, hey. young Cubs coming up together. Right, Paul? Absolutely. Absolutely. Thanks for Hello. joining the show. Thank you again, as always. Paul, thanks so much for joining the show. You are uh, you are a good guy. 
Oh, wait, hold on. Somebody put a comment here. Mike F. Fasolo's robe is from the Martha Stewart work. From <laughs> I, uh, I, I got didn't it directly know that from Martha. Existed, but yeah, it's good to know. <laughs> oh, look at this. Hold on. Uh, Mike Ponce actually said something. Thank you for the kind words and thanks to CBS for the opportunity to speak. That is, it's our pleasure, Mike, and I take all the credit. As you should. As I always do. <laughs> uh, oh, actually, you got another comment here. It reminds me of the big Lebowski dude <laughs> role. And that's, that's my dream life right there. His, Mike his abides. Life. All right. So, Paul, um, you are a writer with many credits. How many uh, issues or series of Archie would you say that you've written over the years? Oh, gee, I don't know. I, I contributed to the, the flagship Archie title. I contributed to the new little Archie Digest. Uh, I did work on all 34 issues of Archie's Weird Mysteries. I heard about that. Right, I remember the that. Claim of fame. Yep. And, and, and then other stuff like Sonic the Hedgehog and Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. Uh, you were even and, credited. And, and, I have a book yeah. that's, cre that's credited to you. It's like a collection of Archie comics, a really thick yeah, that was right. that was some of my editing and research and historian work. Uh, the Archie Americana series. There was a uh, uh, twenty volumes in all, where we looked at uh, various decades: nineteen forties, fifties, sixties, and that was great. I enjoyed putting those books together. We did two volumes for each decade. Uh, great, great project, and, and and I worked on it. I I I worked on it for almost as many decades. <laughs> <laughs> as we were celebrating now you know, paul you like you also your project or something you've written enough you've written a non-fiction book something about Amin and costello also right well now i'm working on a book called scared silly which was uh tied into that blog you showed uh about horror comedies uh so so classic vintage comedy films with comedians getting mixed up in spooky situations uh and it's eventually i will finish that <laughs> but it's uh you know, it's one of those things that I do like when I have spare time, which sometimes uh, years go by and I don't have any spare time. But it looks uh, like you've done quite a, a lot on this, Paul. Yeah, well, if you if you if you look at that blog, if you go to the the right Ali McGraw, I love Ali McGraw. If you go to the right hand side of the page up top, there's Ali McGraw. There's an alphabetical list of all the reviews that I've actually completed uh, so far, but uh, I still have a long way to go. Is that um, Ali McGraw? That's how I'm, big, draw. I'm a big fan. That's my Valentine's Day post, my goofing around <laughs> because because the um, Vincent Price film, the abominable Doctor Fives. Uh, if you scroll up, the uh, goofs on that. Um, I don't know. I need to scroll. Phrase. I'm just going to say on yeah. Ally McGraw. It was just it was it was goofing on the the love story uh, tagline. So, Paul tonight has brought us a special treat, Mike. I like treats. You like treats, Paul. Um, oh, actually, you know what I should do, Paul? I, you actually were kind enough to show me some of your your work. So I'm going to just cycle through it real quick. You worked on... Worked on some Tex Avery stuff for Dark Horse. Oh, wow. That's nice. All right. Here is your Archie oh, Weird Mysteries. Yeah. Very, very nice. Yeah. A little superhero work in there. Archie Marcana. That was the best of the 70s. Yeah. Yeah. I remember. The, I have that book. I have that book. That's a DC book I did. Oh, what'd Good you write case. in DC? Uh, I, that lead story on the cover there with Bibbo fighting everybody. Damn, he got a cover story, Mike. You don't have a cover story. I don't have a Wikipedia page either. Not, <laughs> or, not or that an I'm IMDb page. the community. I don't need an IMDb. <laughs> <laughs> this is a history book. So this is a, a, actually a comics history book uh, that I, that I co-wrote, co-edited, and co-researched. And uh, yeah, it's it's about art, art. Before there was Archie, it was called MLJ, and it sprung up uh, just as Superman hit big in Action Comics, and it was all superheroes. And this is the history of Archie's superheroes. Hmm. You think I'd figure out how to hold control the screen a little better, so I'm not covering should, Paul, but yeah, you should put Paul up there. Take I'm trying. I, Paul, Paul okay. up in my I'm corner. randomly meshing. Oh, let me look at the colorful graph. <laughs> Hold on, let me just add Mike Ponce to this. There you go. <laughs> 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 shift, uh, the, Sonic, shift the pictures Sonic around. Collection. That has one of my stories in it. Oh, Turtles. you worked on the turtles. What a Jeff Smith cover. Oh. And uh, and there's two stories inside I wrote, and Stan Sakai drew one of them, and Gary Fields the other. Let me see if I can put Paul over here. 
See if I, am I allowed to move Paul? I can't move Paul. How come you can't move Paul? I don't know. It, you think by now I'd read re be how to control this thing. You still haven't read the directions. This I was a, 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 a story I wrote for Dave Ryan. He co-wrote it actually with me. And it's part of his War the Independence series. And it was obviously the humor issue. And everybody is in this story. And, and, and you know, it, it allows me to say that I've written bazillions of characters. You're like, I worked on service and they're in flaming carrot. And they're like, yeah. Really? And you were like, kind of. <laughs> they're, they're all in there. So, well, this is really good. And I'm, I'm, thank you for setting up your credits. Now, tonight, Mike, uh, Paul brought a couple of script pages uh, and he's going to talk with us a little bit about uh, scripting and then what it looks like um, on the page. Uh, Paul, so first, just uh, set this up. Uh, Zoe is what? Zoe, this was done for a, um, a special charity project. Uh, my friend Erica Schultz uh, reached out to me at some point. And you might know Erica. And yep. she uh, she asked me if I would donate a story for an anti-bullying uh, comic. It was like a two-issue special. And so I I said, yeah, you know, as long as I could pick my artist. Uh, and and I picked uh, Chris Allen, who uh, did T Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles for many years. And he and I met in college. And He's he's been a long time. I met him too. Trip. He did a sketch for me when I when years and years ago in, in my art book. He was a nice guy. Yeah, so, yeah. So so this is Zoe. I'm going to show uh, some of the art here. That's page one. Uh, I don't have page two. I have page. I have to upload page two. Here's page three. You have every page four, other page. so you can get a sense of the the artwork. Um, and and what's this about, Paul? Real quick, because we're going to show the script in a second. Uh, this story, you'd think I would be more prepared for this, right? So I gave you this story, and I'm trying to remember what it is. It was about, um, <laughs> it was basically about, you know, comics fans or comic geeks or nerds, if you want to call them, getting picked on, you know, by the cool kids. Um, and so, you know, because the theme of the comic is anti-bullying, you know, you want to talk about anti-bullying initiatives and, and, and all that, but, uh, that was basically the gist of it. You know, what's going to happen with these kids? And kind of what happens is that the the comics kids kind of take revenge uh, in a way that can be seen almost as bullying as well. So the kind of story was like, don't fight, you know, don't, don't fight bullying with more bullying. You know, if somebody's uh, embarrassing you or making you look foolish, you know, don't turn around and do that to them because then it's kind of like the same type of thing. You know, so that was the the gist of the story. All right. So here's what I'm going to see if I can put Paul in the top. There, right there. Paul's in the corner. And I'm put I'm yourself in where I am. Put me where I am. You are? Okay. There you now go. What? Now what do now, I do? Now if you cover somebody up, it's just me. So it's. You're so generous. <laughs> well, the robe is already covering you up. Thank you. Aaron, um, I leave for five minutes. <laughs> Um, okay, so here's what we're going to do. Um, I'm going to ask you to take us through uh, the script. Uh, there, the script is in two parts. Um, you're doing a setup here. Yeah. Only so, two panels. And this is all for panel one. And then this is all for panel, page one, panel two. Um, so you're doing a long setup. Why? Why? Why so much? uh text here in the setup paul uh because because i want to establish the the setting uh and also the characters so for this this gives the artist all the information he needs to uh, really inform the whole story because uh, if you don't have you know your your settings worked out and especially if you don't have your characters worked out you've got nothing and 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 really honestly I always say this uh, when people ask me about writing that the, the first rule and the main rule in writing is to know your characters because everything that happens in your story is going to have different reactions from all the different characters. Every character is going to react different. So if you don't, don't know that there, you're, you're in trouble. So this is kind of setting up, you know, who these kids are, uh, especially the, um, you know, the antagonist and the protagonist. And, you know, in this case, it's a shorter story. So I, it's not really as defined for the individual characters as it would be for, say, an Archie story. But uh, it still has to set uh, the, the time and the place and, and and the basic backdrop. 
So I'm gonna I'm gonna move my head over here so you can see me. Move your head, Paul. The other way. There you go. <laughs> yeah. So as we peer around your script, I, I see you, you know, you spend a bit of time setting up Narrows Bluff Junior Senior High School. You know, you, you've clearly outlined the way they speak by using bold. Um, I think it's very interesting now. If you want to just we'll take a quick peek at the at the at the first panel, you can see the setup. And you can see you've set up a cafeteria. Now, I don't think the artist drew in quite as much as you you asked for, including a, a sign on the wall. Yeah, that's um, fine. And and that's fine. You know, I, I will sometimes give more than what's needed. But, you know, at the end of the day, it, it has to live on the page in a way that's aesthetically pleasing to the eye and makes sense. And, of course, you know, artists are skilled at being able to take uh, the top level elements and make it work as a whole you know so nothing's really lost by anything that was left out yeah so you've got you basically you have uh three high school kids and a bully walking up um so let's see we got and there was and you also had uh the girl right so you had the three uh kids that are about to get bullied the girl that's walking up you can see her passing from left passing to right so they show the continuity and you see the bullies in the background and you know they're going to be walking into the foreground. So let's look at um, script, second part. Uh, so you got a long panel across uh, the page. Remember seeing the girl, she's a little shocked and sad, right? And it looks like the artist captured that. And now all of it is the bullies doing what bullies do. Right. Yeah, it's just their lines of dialogue to, to tease and mock. So here we have it, you know, and they, and you 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 know you called out they're 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 being physically mean as well, right? Like there's 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 a level yes. of physicality, and I think I think you can key in on this um, this young girl who is walking by, and you can see she's not like laughing and she's not impressed by this, and he seems to have captured that really well. Absolutely. All right, so now we go into. Uh, page two, again, you, you're very generous with the artist. You give them a lot of uh, setup. Um, so it looks like one panel, one, two, and I think we conclude on panel three, four, five. Okay, so you have a, a, a rather substantial page here. Uh, do you want to just talk us through what you were trying to accomplish with this page? Uh, and then I'll pull a page up as well. So let me get page two up. So page two is this. What what were you trying to accomplish? Yeah, I think that I think the basic uh, the the basic thought of this whole page is that these kids that are being picked on now have an ally in this girl, and she's in, in, ingratiating herself to to them, befriending them, and and wants to help them uh, through this this situation that they've gone through. You know, so they come so up you, with this plan. You have a fan here, Paul. This person, Diane Harlow, really. Really is cheering behind you, and, and oh. I don't. I'm wondering: is Diana a person or an act, a cat? <laughs> I, can't, I can't tell. Could be a cat, Your Honor. I'm not a cat. Um, so here, so you see the page here, and uh, it looks like you're, you know, you're providing a lot of very important stage direction as well. You know, you get the bullies exiting the scene; they're laughing. Uh, they're driving some dialogue that that is very uh, in keeping with what you'd expect for the the reader uh, level, right? What what reader level is this? This was uh, they did two issues. One was supposed to be uh, kind of the the G, maybe a little bit towards P, PG, and then the other issue, and that was my issue. And then the other issue was was where they aged things up. So I, I tried to write it on you know, at Archie level or a little above Archie level. Uh, so for sure, I would say this is a six to six to 12 uh, target. Yeah. So mm. it looks like he did a really nice job of capturing what you were calling for. So you got that long panel where they're leaving. Then you've got Zoe on the bed. Um, she's reading her book uh, and, you know, she's, you know, thinking, why don't they leave those guys alone? And you can see her there. And then you, then you introduce, a shock scene and oh, no, that's on the next scene. Uh, now, why, why is this zombie bursting into the room? Uh, zombie. What did I write here? Let's see. Uh, it's, 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 oh, it's her brother, Ted. Yeah. Ted gives her the idea 
Ted is the guy. He's um, he's the guy that's into makeup. Uh, he's you know he's studying film makeup and whatnot, and uh, he gives her the idea that to you know scare these scare these bullies. Uh, okay, so uh, she gets the idea. So she's initially scared with the reader, but like yeah. all ages books, you know, you have to resolve pretty quickly, like Scooby Doo. Like, oh, yeah. it's not really that scary, you know, writing for age uh, level. Now the zombies all smiles. Everything's going to be okay. Um, and then she reminds him, oh, oh, it's just your lovable brother. And oh, you jerk, you know, not using yeah. any curse words. Right. I mean, if the solo had written, it would have been like a scene out of Pulp Fiction, but right, Mike? like a sailor. <laughs> <laughs> and then, um, you know, what I liked about this page was, uh, can you make your friends like zombies too? And then Ted uh, sets this nice cliffhanger, you know, but why do you need zombies? Which which I, I, I like because you've created the page turn imperative, right? You're like, well, turn the page and you'll find out. And I thought, right. you built, I think you set that up nicely. Very intentional. Yeah, talk about talk about how you think about the page, right? Like you, you had a transition from the first scene to get to this cliffhanger, you know, but you didn't have a lot of space. Right. So what's your strategy for trying to fit in a lot of information in, in such a tight space? I try to I try to do that page turn thing at the end of I well, I, I do it two ways. Uh and this is from my work at Archie. Uh it really informs that. Uh I try to do either uh, a page turn final panel so you get a reveal on the following page or if i've set up you know a humorous gag situation or something that's going to have a payoff or a punchline sometimes i'll have that happen in the last panel okay. uh, because you're going to lose the momentum for a, a punchline or a gag if you have to turn a page so in this case because we're moving a story forward where it's not a, a gaggy jokey thing it's more let's let's have the little oh what's going to happen on the next page so oh, i love it i th i think this, you did a really great job with this and, and set it up nicely mike any thoughts you you have you written for all ages mike uh yeah yeah i do have a question though paul how do you sure. know how many panels to put on a page like is how do i know a, is it just a random uh, oh i'm going to put 3 on this one or 5 on I this try one try to work it out so so a little background i went to school of visual arts I studied animation and cartooning. And when I graduated, I realized I didn't have anatomy perspective or composition down enough to compete with my fellow graduates. But, you know, I was always into storytelling. I even took creative writing at, at School of Visual Arts. And I thought, well, I can draw these things well enough that I can make scripts, you know? So if nothing else, maybe I can get script work. And that's what I did. I put a portfolio together of picture scripts. So, think of it almost like a, a storyboard for a movie. I was laying these things out in thumbnail drawings, you know, but better than stick figures, but not good enough to be published, you know, <laughs> in between. And, you know, ironically, the thing of it, of it is, is when I, when I got work at Archie, you know, I first, I first uh, broke in by uh, freelancing for DC. They had a Looney Tunes magazine uh, in 1989. So I did a couple of, you know, uh, puzzle pages, activity pages for them. And then uh, in 1990, January 1990, I started working on staff at Archie. And then I find out that at least half of the freelance writers, if not more, were doing this picture script thing. Hmm. So it just, it just so happened to be that's what that's how a lot of them turned in their work. So, so in my early years at Archie, I did that. I would draw out all my um, scripts. Once I got to Archie's Word Mysteries, which was much more detailed and layered and evolved i just started doing the the type uh, typed out scripts like you see here uh but i'm always thinking about it in visual terms because of my art school training so even when i'm writing a uh you know a, a typed out script i'm still you know taking a pencil out or a pen and i'm you know making a page and i'm trying to figure out how's this going to look and how's it going to look best and what length should each panel be and how many tiers should there be and how many panels on each page, you know? Um, and sometimes it's driven by the narrative. You know, sometimes you want something bombastic that's gonna take up most of a page or maybe even it's a full page spread because it's a, a big, you know, blown out scene. And other times you gotta get a lot of things in motion and then all of a sudden you end up with, you know, five to six panels, you know? But but I tend to, to stay on the, um, 
the three tier Archie, um, you know, uh, template, you know, so. Okay. Did Good that answer know. your question, Mike? It does. Yes. Yeah. Cause I would, I would have, I would have just tried to write the script first and then work the pages out from there. But if you're working them out as you're, you know, writing them, that's. Mike, yeah, and, that, right and that's, when, and that's fans, when I'm Mike? working alone. When I'm working with an artist, then it's then it's uh, you know uh, like working like getting their feedback on the script. Then it's like another level of figuring things out. Yeah, you know, there's so Mike, many there's Mike, so many you things to this. Just... Your pants. Oh you, yeah, you oh, still yeah. just, just have jump you right outline in. before you write. Uh, I try, I, I've, I've been trying to outline more. More what? More more outlining. <laughs> I try to I outline try to, my outline. Are you outlining, outlining or you're not outlining? I, you, well, but but there is a middle. There's a middle to, in Mike's middle? defense. So I try to outline too as much as I can. Uh, <laughs> I'm going to defend Mike. I try to outline <laughs> as much as I can too. But there are times when the story is going to take you in directions where you might not expect. And, and when that's the case, you can have a, more of a loose outline. And then you know you modify as 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 needed as you progress. Yeah, I mean an outline doesn't have to be you know it's written in stone. You can be right. like, oh, this character is going to go here, but what happens when he goes there? That's you know. now for Robot Chicken. Do you outline or you just write oh just the thing as just a write you just, just write, write it? it? Yeah. When you write a full screenplay, do you do you outline it? I've been trying to outline more, but uh, sometimes I would just jump right in and see what happens. You know, it's and easy. as you can see, all my scripts have been produced everywhere. So that's right. That works well, so well. Well, I I find that just sharing the idea and talking about it is better than writing it. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Here's the idea. I'm Here's never going to do anything with it, but it let, sounds great. And let me get the endorphin rush, okay. and I'm better. <laughs> and then I don't need to do the work. <laughs> then you go take a nap. <laughs> then I go take a nap. I go eat something like Twizzlers. <laughs> <laughs> uh Paul, but do you do you when you would do something like this five page story, you you would outline, you know, the page beats? Yeah, yeah, for sure. Uh for sure. I mean, it, it's a it's a vignette. I mean, really, I mean, I had five pages to play with. Uh it's it's more of a vignette than I would call a story. You know, when I'm doing a 22 page issue of Archie's Rare Mysteries, that's a story because it's gonna have a a clear beginning, middle, and end. And a resolution, uh, whereas this was more of a vignette to get a point across, almost like a custom comic, you know. And I know you've done work with custom comics. I have done custom comics. It looks like somebody from the audience is asking you a question, Mike. Uh, oh, <laughs> it's tough. It's tough. The robe sometimes gets in the way, but it can be done. I have done it. Fortunately, <laughs> there's nothing else other than that T-shirt under that robe, right, Mike? That's right. There's the black T-shirt, and it ends there. He's writing by the seat of the sash. <laughs> and it got awkward. So anyway, <laughs> uh, but you focus mostly, Paul. Uh, you seem to have cut your career on all ages. Um, real quick, um, what is it? what did you do in toys i think you were at mattel for a couple of years and yeah i was talking at about mattel for a long time uh i worked as a copywriter for mattel um and basically i did everything if it needed writing i i did it so i wrote packages you know the things you see in the package uh that talks about the toy and why you why it's cool and why a kid would want it and buy it you know uh and a lot of times the packages are already only advertising for a toy uh so I worked on a lot of that, uh, but I also did work on uh, stories for them. I wrote uh, some animated uh, shorts uh, with Thomas the Train for Mattel. Uh, and that was great because the stories that I wrote, uh, they let, they the, the very concept of those stories was Thomas having these wild dreams. So it wasn't the stodgy. Like how wild? How wild? It, well, it wasn't the stodgy him just, you know, going around <laughs> the tracks. It was like, now he's in outer space. Now he's fighting a sea monster, and we even did uh, some mashups with DC Super Friends. So the characters were like uh, painted up like Superman and Batman. And, and I got to tell you, Mike, I, awesome. I, I'm wondering what all the ones that made it to the cutting room floor, like Thomas. <laughs> Thomas ends up, you know, bound in a crawl in, 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 in an after hours club. <laughs> little little S and M bondage. Going yeah. It's on. Not Thomas <laughs> and like that that's Paul's script for Thomas off the rails. Yeah. Thomas, Thomas 
That's Thomas off the rails. That's good. That's Thomas good. off the rails. We'll just leave it at that because Paul actually has to have a career in this. He can't even <laughs> yeah. comment. Yeah, I'm not like, writing any of these things. Yeah, guys, I'm, this is my job. All you want. I get paid for this. But Mike works for Robot Chicken. So I said to <laughs> that's him, right. Mike can Robot Chicken everything. <laughs> yeah. See that? See? Uh, D. Alley uh, wanted me to rein it back in. Oh, boy. Now you're Thank in trouble. You, See, Rich, Rich, Rich learn something new. Rich, you're right. Mike works for uh, Robot Chicken. Yes, I do. He does. In many that years. World. Many, many years. Thomas stays away. That's a good one, Vince. I think you could do something with that. <laughs> uh, so, Paul, um, you, you're, what do you got coming out? What, what are you working on? Anything? You doing anything special for us? Am I doing anything special? Uh, you know, I haven't written any. Co- well, I did actually do something that I don't even know if it's out yet. I'll mention this. Um, I did a custom comic for a toy company called Chap May. Uh, and it's uh, for their Dinosaur Valley line, which um, might remind you of some other dinosaurs. But um, it was just a fun uh, custom comic book to promote. This toy there is this great like action figure play set that they had. Uh, Tom McWeeny, who you might know, was a longtime comic artist. He did the art. Came out great. Uh, so I don't know if that's out yet, but that would be the next uh, comics thing uh, coming out for me. Uh, yeah. So Now, Paul, where should they find you? Should they find you on Twitter, your website? Where's the best place for them to find or follow you? Well, I don't want anybody following me. You, <laughs> I don't mean nervous. like walking around. I mean, oh, 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 okay. Yeah. Sorry, you know, I put my film noir hat on. And oh, then... we're still on Allie McGraw. Hold on, let me just go <laughs> back. Here's your Twitter. Right Twitter, there. yeah, I mean, if people want to see, I don't do much with Twitter. Um, you know, uh, I don't know, you know, just uh, the best way to really find me is to Google me. When stuff happens, it's, it seems to get out into the world. All right, in let's fact, go. In let's fact, go I, here. In fact, this is oh, he's got a Wikipedia page, something I clearly don't have. In, in <laughs> fact, in fact, the funny thing about Google is I forgot about a about a speaking gig I have in early April that came up on Google, and I was like, oh, I forgot about that. I got to make sure I don't like double book myself, you know. So yeah, so, you got to uh, be you got to be careful, Paul. If if Google's reminding you that you have to be somewhere, you may need to like yeah, set I'm up like, a calendar. Wait a second. I mean, yeah, but I'm supposed to see, speak at a science fiction club in Bergen County. Oh, uh, which one? In the of April. Which um, one? The science fiction club of the Bergen, Bergen, the Bergen County it's, one. Uh, I think that is. I think that's what it is. It's um, it's. Um, it's an Upper Saddle River. Yeah, yeah. I, 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 those that, are very uh, nice United people. Phil DePardo, right? Phil DePardo. Phil DePardo. Right? Phil, DePardo right? Phil, yes. Phil, Phil. I spoke there <laughs> nice in 2014, guy. and I was supposed to speak there again on April 4th. And I had totally forgotten about it, but now it is. But no one, one needs to know. But what we do brain. need to have, we do need to know is it is. Time for check this out, which I do believe is uh, one of the most popular features on the internet, Mike. Besides my robe. Besides your robe, which got a lot of chatter tonight. <laughs> um, do you, did you, Paul? You brought something that you'd like for me to pull up on yeah, the screen? Yeah, yeah. Um, I just want to, uh, you know, people who are who want to be comic writers, uh, you know, there's a lot of great resources out there. Um, you know, uh, there's a book by Denny O'Neill uh, called The Guide to Writing DC Comics. Uh, Understanding Comics by Scott McCloud is like a must to read. Uh, I know Stan Lee has a book too, but I, I've never seen it. So I, you know, I don't know what to say about it except it's by Stan Lee. But I always point people to a book that's out of print called The Secrets of Action Screenwriting. I think there's still a digital version available, but it's by the guy who runs this page. Oh, there it is there. Uh, or that's um, the blue thing is what he used for the cover, but that's a different thing that he's got on there. But um, this guy, William C. Martell, he's written about 20 to 25 films that actually got produced. Wow. A lot of them are, are direct. There's the book, The Secrets of Action Screenwriting. Um, they're, um, you know, they're, they're, they're a lot of direct-to-video action movies. Uh, but, you know, this book, is 
the most practical book I've read on writing uh, movie scripts or otherwise that I've ever read. It's really, he really gets into the nitty gritty of how you set a scene, how you create the characters, how you give different attributes to the characters, how you make them human so the, the audience reacts to them. You know, he's got a whole thing in there where he dissects uh, the Die Hard scene with Bruce Willis stepping on the glass. That's the moment where Bruce Willis becomes everybody in the audience, you know, and you're, and you're with him the whole time for the rest of the movie. You know, so uh, it's just a very practical book. You know, a lot of those other screenwriting books are very heady and, well, here's a special technique, you know, and it's like, no, this guy is like, do they say with that write, spooky voice? This is why you write it. This is what works. You know, these are the reversals that need to happen to continually put your hero into peril so that the stakes keep getting raised. It, it's See? great. And what I love about it more than anything is that even though it's the, the secrets of action screenwriting, and even though that's that site script secrets is geared towards action, you could take any of those tips that he gives and apply them to any genre romantic comedy horror drama indie whatever you know style you're trying to write in uh you can apply are you his, writing that down mike i am you are it looks like you're writing something down i am writing it down wow so paul made a recommendation that you're actually going to check out he's never I'm, checked out any of my recommendations well why would i yeah, all right. So I don't have you. you don't have an IMDB page. I don't have any recommendations page. about robes. So. All right, Mike, it's, <laughs> it's now time for check it out. Do you have a check it out tonight, Mike? Um no, I don't. All right, then I do. And I'll I'll I, this is a great graphic. Isn't that a great graphic? Much better than the one I originally tried to put up there. Okay. So out of this book, uh, this is um never get it right, Justice League. Uh, international. It was, uh, I think, 1989. They rebooted this series, and they introduced a lot of characters, uh, reintroduced other characters. And what I wanted to do in this check this out was a little educational moment. So, in this particular scene, you barely even have to read the dialogue. You can get most of it from the body language. Uh, so, Batman and Doctor Fate are walking toward the um, the action. They hear a crash. Batman takes the lead. And they're fighting. They're not getting along. And he, Dr. Fate explains, well, I have a way of dealing with this. But then Batman puts up one finger, just one finger. Batman says, allow me. And I think what's interesting is, you know, they've been face, face, face. And now you see from Dr. Fate's POV, which is Batman walking into the room and you go, oh, Batman's going to going to do something about it. Um in this scene, virtually no dialogue. You see it once again. He walks up to Martian Manhunter, past Manhunter and the Beetle, past Shazam, and then he goes to Guy Gardner and he says, sit down. And you see the expression change. He's going to challenge Batman. He thinks twice. He's actually afraid. And Batman says, now, shall we begin? And I just thought, in a in in literally, you know, one, two, three, four very tiny word balloons, you set up the character by showing how the other characters react to them. So my check this out is is you know check out the first issue, which was this reboot uh, uh, by Keith Giffen and um, Jan Dematius, uh, Kevin McGuire, and Al Gordon. Um, it's it's real, like a master class in how to introduce characters in a large ensemble. Buddy, I, I would like to add something on top of that. Uh, when I went to School of Visual Arts, one of my teachers was Joe Orlando. Uh, and Joe was a longtime DC Comics writer, editor, artist. And one of the uh, things he used to have us do is he used to have us do an assignment, a weekly assignment. We had to take a photo from a magazine or a newspaper, and then we had to draw the image from that photo, but draw the before panel and the after panel. And so we, we created a, a sequence, right? With three panels. We would tack it up to the wall and then he would make us go all the way to the back of the room. And we would look at these things. And the, and the idea was not just that we created sequential storytelling by doing that, but also that could you tell what was going on even if you couldn't read the balloons? Wow. 
So it was, it was always about, could you tell? Are the characters blocked out in the right way? It, uh, you know, use of blacks, spotting the blacks. You know, there's a, there's a, it became less prevalent in the 90s with a lot of uh, the image style that came in. But before that, you could look at comics and there were a lot of uh, figures that are almost completely black. I mean, Batman is, is lent, lends himself to that, but you know, you could, there's just blocks of space where you know what it is and what's going on. Yeah. You don't even need that. You could see like, the body could, language. Yeah. You look could at just remove, the... He's only got what four, he's got three word balloons here and you could remove them all and still know what's going on. You can still know what's going on. Yeah. And what I love about this is the body language of Batman leaning forward and Guy Gardner leaning backward. And then what is essentially the same size, uh, one, two, three, four, this is middle panels four, uh, panel five is really three panels, but it doesn't take any more space than panel six. So what we see is this, um, back to your question, Mike, how do you know how many panels? I think you have to go for the feeling of what the right panel is in this center image is the dominant. He probably could have resolved Batman walking through the rule in one panel, but creating these beats and showing how they all defer to Batman made it uh, a respect thing. So everybody but Guy Gardner respected him, but then he commanded the respect. So I think like, I think you know how many panels there are with experience and that you're right here, Mike, you want to, yeah, there's a bug is, flying around. <laughs> Was it that dull that you were like, that's ridiculous. If it's radioactive, oh, you'll become a superhero. <laughs> anyway, so that's my check it out. Uh, Justice League International number one is like a master class in how to um, introduce new characters in a large ensemble cast. Uh, definitely worth checking out. Last thing, Paul, and something that we ask every guest who's ever been on the show, what is one piece of advice you wish you had received early in your career? Uh, the nuances of working with licensors or character gatekeepers, uh, because when it's not your own character, you 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 definitely have to abide by whatever rules may have been set up by a licensor or an editor for characters. Uh, some characters you have leeway on, some you don't, uh, and you you know you need to know how to navigate that and and to and to understand that. You know, it's nothing personal. You know, you may be close to your writing and like, oh, they want me to change that. Oh, that stinks. I really want to keep that in there. You have to be able to say, hey, you know, it's their characters. It's not mine. And I understand. Uh, and I'll give you an example. So on that DC issue that I showed you uh, or that you showed us, um, in in the story, Bibbo is telling tall tales. Bibbo's this guy, for those who don't know, he's Superman's pal. He owns a bar. And in this story, uh, he's telling tall tales about how he took on all the toughest uh, villains in the DC universe. And in one of the stories he tells, he's talking about the Joker. And the Joker mentions Batman in my script. But at the time uh, of, of writing this story, all of the uh, DC titles were in groups. Uh, so there was the Batman group of titles, the Superman yeah. group of titles, the Flash, whatever. And each of those groups had group editors. So all of the, because I went and included every villain from every, you know, series, um, all of the group editors had to weigh in with my editor and give their approval or disapproval of things. And it turned out that Batman couldn't be mentioned. So the editor talks to me and he says, uh, you can't mention Batman. I'm like, what do you mean? And he said, well, the way it works in the Batman universe is that Batman is kind of like an urban legend and nobody's really sure if he exists or not. That's how he's treated. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, well, the Joker is talking about him. He knows he exists. He's been hitting the draw by him enough times. And uh, the editor was like, well, you know, the, the group editor on Batman just wants you not to figure out a way to 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 evoke batman without saying the word batman which i did you know so you know it was one of those things where i hemmed and hawed about it at the time but then i realized oh i get it you know and that's and, why you're getting paid to write right if you right. if you do if your own characters you wouldn't need to get paid that's right right like mike i 
I give him money every time he shows up on this show. Exactly. Because I'm I haven't gotten, I've gotten a t-shirt yet. Right yet. No, you haven't. <laughs> Neither's Paul. There's no more shirts. <laughs> All right, Paul, thank you for joining us. It was a pleasure. We're going to we're going to put you into the green room. Everybody should uh, Google Paul Castiglia. And if his name is on it or you're in Bergen County and you want to go to the sci fi uh, thing, Paul just found out about it by Googling himself. So maybe he'll show up. He'll, he'll Google where it is. <laughs> Paul, thanks so much for joining and for sharing your script tonight. This is a uh, great educational value. Thank you. Thank so you much. so much. I appreciate it. And I encourage uh, everybody out there just, you know, if, if you have a desire to do this, dream it, you'll do it. You know, there's resources out there like, like Buddy's comic book school and, 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 and you'll rock it. So go for it. All right, Paul, go in the green room. There's a uh, Thomas, the toy, Dredge, Troy, Troy, and you can play with all of them. All right. Any of the ones you want. This guy wrote Thomas. My kids he loved did. Thomas. Who doesn't love Thomas? Everybody loves Thomas. Um, so that was an interesting show, Mike. Uh, well, it was I think, very yeah, interesting. a little. It, oh, Vince, thank Paul, but Paul's gone. Thanks. I Paul. mean, he's he's in the green room. But he's not. He's, he's spaghetti. He's hold on. Here he is. He's back. Take your thanks. <laughs> uh, see, there you go. Mike Ponce still in the green room. He's Just still, hanging he's out. Stuck. It's like a maze. He couldn't get out. So next week, Mike, I am not going to be here. Uh oh. Mm -hmm. What does that mean? Guest. We have we have a guest host. Oh boy. That's right. I have a fill-in guest host who will be coming on, uh, deep from the uh, um, from the history of uh, DC Comics. Uh, she worked there. That's where I got to know her. Uh, she is uh, well known in the New York comic book community, and uh, we'll be announcing it. So uh, for all of you who come specifically to see uh me you'll be greatly disappointed but mike you'll be here right i will be here yes you will be here if she wants me as a co-host i mean she could probably pick her own yeah i never even thought of that i just sort of <laughs> thought like oh she'll want you. well he's gonna be there anyway he's gonna be there we'll go really zoom in on our heads which looks good at our age because <laughs> yeah. at our age that's what everybody wants to see <laughs> so um oh look people are thanking paul oh and Somebody likes Percy. All right, Mike, that's it for the show. I'm going to punch you into the green room. Uh, wait for me there, and we'll chit-chat about my trip to L.A. soon. All right, looking forward. Of course, he's looking forward to it. All right, everybody, uh, thank you so much for joining. Be sure to like and subscribe to the channel. Um, we love seeing you, uh, and we'll continue providing educational materials, as I said, next week. Uh, we'll have a special guest host who will come on uh, and bring some uh, sparkle and fun and uh, whatever she decides to do. It's uh, I can't stop her. Uh, so from the whole team here at Comic Book School, thank you and keep making comics. Let me see if I know how to hit the the end out thing here because it's not it. <laughs>